Hello, everyone. Um, I want to welcome you to the final event in the Documenting Fashion Research Group um, schedule for this year, this academic year. And it's such an enormous pleasure for me um, that this is an event for Alexis Romano. Alexis was my um, PhD student. And so I had the enormous pleasure of working with her and seeing this amazing project progress to PhD and then now to, um, to, to become a wonderful book. So congratulations to Alexis. Um, the book is part of a series that I edit that's a collaboration between the Courtauld Institute of Art, where I teach dress history, and the um, publishing, sorry, and Bloomsbury Publishing. And this is a third in the series, and it's called Preta Porte, Paris and Women. And it's such a rich, such a wonderful book, and the first critical examination of French Preta a porter And as such, it, it's such an original contribution to the field and opens up, I think, ways that we can look at fashion, not just through the way it's manufactured, the way it's produced, the way it's um, designed, the way that it's promoted, and certainly it does all of those things, but also its resonance for women, for the wearers, for the women who were working in the industry at the time, to think about the, this complex network of women, of different kinds of agencies who are constructing a particular way of being and a particular kind of fashion. And Alexis has been um, really tenacious in finding different kinds of sources and different ways in which she can um, find out more and try and get through to a new understanding of French fashion in that period. Alexis is now a lecturer in fashion studies at Parsons School of Art in New York. Previously, as I said, she did her PhD at the Courtauld Institute. She has MAs from the Bard Graduate Center in New York and the Sorbonne in Paris. And she's also co-founder of the very wonderful Fashion Research Network, which if you haven't heard of it, then please um, make sure you sign up for their newsletters because they run brilliant events and they also do rounds up, round round a rounds up, I don't know where the plural goes, of um, events internationally as well. It's a really wonderful thing. So Alexis is, a, is such a wonderful speaker and I'm really, Alexis can't be more thrilled to have you doing this here this evening. So thank you very much. And I'm going to hand over to Alexis now. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the chat and I will pose all of them or as many as I can manage to Alexis after her talk. So thank you, Alexis. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, okay, so I'd like to begin with uh, some acknowledgements and thanks to the editorial team at Bloomsbury, especially Frances Arnold, uh, who steered this book to publication despite a very slow writer and then a pandemic. Um, many friends and colleagues have supported this work, providing ideas and encouragement, help with editing and image rights, and, and also couches in Paris. I'd like to thank the Courtauld Institute of Art for hosting this launch and as Rebecca was, was just mentioning, really being the forum where this research blossomed uh, and also for providing funding along the way. Uh, other funders are the Passold Research Fund, the Design History Society, the Textile Society, the Society for the Study of French History and the Bard Graduate Center. Um, I'd like to acknowledge institutions where I spend many hours, many, many hours poring over images, objects, and texts. Um, the Musée de la Mode at the Palais Galliera, the Musée de la Mode et du Textile at Les Arts Décoratifs, the Museum at the Fashion Institute of Technology, uh, the archives of the Galerie Lafayette, Maison Veille, the Emmanuel Kahn Estate, the Bibliothèque Formée, and the Bibliothèque Nationale de la France, among many others. I owe thanks to those who shared their memories, including Claude Brouet, Monique Nodex, Claude Falk, Françoise Vincent Ricard, Peter Knapp, and the late Emmanuel Kahn. Um, immense, immense gratitude to Dr. Rebecca Arnold for all of her work, guiding this research from its very beginning through to today, quite literally. So, that it has been touched by her brilliance is reason enough to read it, in my opinion. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Working with you has been 
one of the highlights of my professional life. And finally, thank you to everyone who's here now for helping me launch this book. Uh, so I welcome your questions and comments uh, here today or in the future. As you see, I have my, my email address up. So please feel free to note it and stay in touch. So this book began with an interest in French design and culture, as well as uh, an interest in the rough uh, the periods uh, that it studies. But it became a topic of interest when I read the same narrative over and over. In French fashion history, there are very few mentions of ready-made clothes before the 1960s, other than to say that it wasn't good or popular or that it didn't really exist. Of course, there are a few exceptions, notably coming from the fields of labor history and geography. Um, but the more I read, the more dissatisfied I became and the more I wanted to learn more about this industry. The typical narrative of French fashion history prioritizes haute couture, right? That's um, incredibly expensive, you know, inaccessible, um, uh, uh, highly regulated mode of made to measure clothing production. Um, it also, uh, idealizes the production of iconic designers and conflates uh, Paris and fashion. And even though French department stores had offered ready-made garments increasingly since their appearance in the mid 19th century, um, this narrative has pretty much been omitted in, in discussions uh, of, of fashion history. Embedded firmly within the country's heritage and conceptions of Frenchness and propagated by the industry, this history is, has been slightly difficult to deconstruct and reassess. Um, the scholarly tendency to center on high fashion sustains elitist historical narratives, despite, of course, uh, which we're all familiar, the growing number of interdisciplinary inquiries into everyday dress and identity. And although my book does address high fashion, by opening up French fashion history to include the much less expensive uh, ready to wear and positioning its consumers as players and agents, I hope to advance a more inclusive and multi-layered understanding of fashion in France. So this book is a sort of call to more of such questioning and scholarship. It's also a call to challenge educators to lead with the ready-made or other forms of everyday dress in curriculums. Um, but it does build on a rich body of secondary research in French material and popular culture, uh, its post-war history, uh, and in women's history and their consumer and gender identities. Okay. So what is my book about? It traces the development of the ready-made clothing industry between 1945 and 1968 and connects it to France's wider project of um, post-war modernization and reconstruction to shifting conceptions of national identity and modernity, as well as the experience of women. And actually it sees ready to wear as the sort of glue that joins all of these fragments together in one picture. It's a cultural history that brings together different sources from surviving garments, fashion magazines, film, photography, and interviews to oral histories, situating the ready-made in wider post-war discourses of gender, art, um, design, urbanism, technology, and the everyday. And in so doing, it addresses myriad topics, including trade fairs, plastic, um, uh, the city of Paris, the Franco-American dialogue, the work of specific designers, brands, and photographers, design movements and art genres from international modernism to um, op art and, and new wave cinema. So France ends the war in a state of economic and political collapse. The ready-made industry would undergo heightened growth during the book's period of study, as France modernized its industrial infrastructure, as it created or attempted to create a mass consumer economy in the context of the Trente Glorieuse, which was a period of post-war economic growth fueled by technological determinism. 
And France's project of modernization also extended to women who were granted suffrage in 1944 and to its cities, which underwent population growth and great physical transformation. As you see from the book's title, Paris and women are central to this narrative and viewed as real and symbolic markers of shifts in conceptions of modernity, gender, and national identity. Um, you're looking at sort of the first and the last image or one of the first images in the book and the last kind of um, book ending the period studying both of women um, overlooking vistas in Paris, but you can see that they're, they're very different. And they are actually of, of haute couture garments. And in the middle, you have um, this 1950s uh, expression of a triumphant femininity. Women have uh, conquered Paris in their ready to wear as the, as the title, um, as the title uh, indicates. So the, over, the book is, is about a shift in, in, in all of these different conceptions. Um, the, industry, the industry reinvented itself as the French state reshaped its own image with two new governments, when it was largely embroiled in colonial struggles and increasingly shed its peripheral territories, dealing with its loss of cultural and political hegemony and a new diverse population of immigrants. France's abrupt and broad modernization brought about immobilisme or resistance to change as the industry at the same time steered away from haute couture, which was a fixed feature of the country's identity and patrimony. Modernity comprised tensions between modernization and tradition, prosperity and standardization, and women's ambiguous status as citizens. This fraught relationship to modernization can be read uh, in a magazine page from uh, 1956 that you see here, showing the model Simone Dayencourt in a coat by Albert Lampereur, who is a manufacturer, who is also a great, um, uh, who, who, who worked to, invent, to advance the industry as well. Paris, the 19th century city of monuments, is gone and replaced by a blur evoking urban speed. Gone too is haute couture, which upheld meanings of Paris and fashion and which dominated the press up to that time. This picture is about ready to wear. As the fashion editor Claude Brouet wrote, uh, and I'm just reading uh, her, her, her writing here, bravo la confection française, the bet is won, won by the young manufacturers of Prêt-à-Porter who rescued French confection from its routine. She's also referring to two different um, terms for ready to wear. Confection, which was used um, earlier and up to about the, the, the early 60s and Prêt-à-Porter, which comes to be in the 50s and really symbolizes um, this, this new identity for the, for the in, industry. Um, the photographer Lionel Kazan used realistic photographic techniques to capture the electric push to modernize both industry and city and presented fashion that would parallel this movement. Um, and you're looking at the, the published page uh, and the, the original photograph, which a little bit, which, which more clearly shows that a car is creating that blur, which is really very abstracted in the, in the finished um, product that readers would have read. So um, the electric push to modernize both industry and city. However, the model seemed hesitant, caught between two worlds, out of step and unbalanced. Would she tip over or push ahead? As seen as the, in this example, fashion, the fashion body and space assume symbolisms in the way they are represented in image. And this book discusses various spaces, spaces, domestic, interior, um, urban, the street, high modernist, and they are all full of um, different meanings. The analysis of image uh, in relation to object, history, and theory is the core methodology of this book. Thus, its inclusion uh, in the series, um, fashion, visual, and material interconnections. And further, the book draws meaning in the intersections between the construction of fashion and the production and dissemination of the photographic image 
as the technology behind the ladder also um, developed. And in the post-war period, photography, fashion photography was still pretty young, responding to cultural shifts, borrowing from other genre, from documentary photography, new wave cinema, um, and the moving image. There is also a chapter that delves into representations in color film photography in the 1950s. The mass media had grown so sophisticated, um, it elicited commentary from philosophers, such as Roland Barthes and Jean Baudrillard, who wrote of its complex uh, sign systems and processes of myth-making, which inflated meanings behind objects of consumer culture. Um, and of course, this is Roland Barthes and his well-known uh, article for the fashion magazine, Marie Claire, where he talks about fashion and its media culture and the potent ways that that has affected um, everyday uh, or modern experience. Um, this book contains five chapters. The first situates the importance of the fashion magazine and image um, spanning the book's wider period of study, the mid 40s to the mid 60s. Um, it introduces its main themes, women, Paris and ready-made dress as constructions and realities in the press, a lens onto the ways in which ideas were constructed by the industry and then interpreted by consumers. Magazine's imagery instructs readers on how to view and experience dress, how to locate the self in fashion's geography in the 40s and 50s and prior to that. They visualized Paris's centralization, at which point this construction relied on the juxtaposition of haute couture and privileged spaces like Paris's monuments and bridges. As you see in this central image uh, from 1946 um, from Vogue, illustrations of women were interspersed uh, and they were in couture um, among um, uh, fragments of uh, Parisian monuments and other notable buildings, transferring their historical weight and erratic value to the, to the clothing and the body underneath. My book argues that the introduction of ready to wear in the press slowly from the 1940s was key to a shift in definitions of fashion around the notions of the everyday, technological modernity, and a multifarious female identity. In the mid 50s, there's a more pronounced presence of it. Um, and by the 60s, it's pretty much featured more predominantly than couture or clothing patterns. And you're looking at a picture of Hélène Lazareff, uh, who founded Elle magazine in 1944, 45, after she spent the war period in the States, probably observing the um, considerable advances in the American ready to wear industry. Vogue may have held on to older ideas of elite fashion and femininity, but this value shift was also observable in its pages, notably with its regularly reoccurring section, tout fait, tout prêt à porter, all ready, all ready to wear, which often presented um, an active woman outside of the studio, on the city streets, or engaged in another outdoor activity. And importantly, the increased use of photography in the French press as opposed to illustration, further disseminated concepts of the everyday and action mechanization in relation to the dressed bodies it captured. The everyday, the quotidian, garnered considerable philosophical um, reflection in the post-war period. And this chapter draws on Henri Lefebvre's work uh, in particular. And so for the next two chapters, we go back in time. Uh, to the Fourth Republic. And they alternate between a discussion of the industry as it, along with the government, rebuilt and underwent a pretty conflicted process of identity building. Um, and in the next chapter, so industry, and then in the next chapter, how these contexts and notably um, industrial modernity were dispersed to women magazine readers. And in the last two chapters, we travel to the 1960s or the early Fifth Republic, where France is a member of the new European economic community and the industry moves into a new phase and identity 
um, which I um, uh, refer to as Stilisme, which is composed of designer-led brands. Um, and we have the same alternating between industry and then women and, in, and imagery. Image analysis in the last chapter, uh, chapter five, is enriched by the, um, by the testimonies of, of two French women um, from some of the oral histories that I, that I undertook for this research, adding their embodied experience of fashion culture. And this is meant to underscore how women are agents in this and other historical narratives, not only acting in reaction to forces of politics and consumerism. So for the remaining 20 minutes or so, maybe a bit less, uh, I'll flesh out some of these points and attempt to illustrate my methodology of inferring meaning from representations of women's space and dress, drawing from various parts of the book. So I might be slightly disjointed. Um, as we consider the industry's development, I'd like to think about how some women experienced it visually and spatially taking the fashion magazine as an interface between the personal and the macro. The post-war fashion uh, history of France is often framed by scholars of dress as a triumphant comeback story of the haute couture industry, which was debilitated during the occupation, of course. They discuss the savior Christian Dior with, with his new look silhouettes or the Théâtre de la Mode, which were um, 15 sets um, decorated by, by leading artists, of various Parisian scenes that housed 170 figurines dressed, in, dressed by 30, 35 haute couturiers. It was exhibited in 1945 and then traveled around France and then abroad to illustrate to everyone that Paris um, and fashion had both returned to their pre-war state uh, strengths. But there is the must, much less familiar narrative of ready to, the ready to wear in, in post-war history. You might find it hidden away in the Palais Galliera archive, which has 15 miniature uh, garments that were um, not haute couture, but made by the manufacturer Lise France, in 1947 intended for display at trade fairs. Their craftsmanship is also impeccable um, with silk and lace gowns of varying silhouettes, woolen suits with peplum waists, dolman sleeves and embroidered details. As couture attempted to rebuild itself, the French ready-made clothing industry underwent heightened um, uh, development in the recovering industrialized economy of the Fourth Republic as I said, and in a way they, they sort of had uh, a way in um, with couture uh, weakened in a sense and more relevant in this new industrial moment. At this time, most of the brands pictured in magazines belonged to the Maison de Couture en gros, which grouped high-end ready-made manufacturers. Um, there was a bit of an identity crisis at play as the growing industry negotiated values of quality, productivity, um, rationalization, and individualism. They were sort of like the haute couture of ready-to-wear, as the name implies, which translates roughly as wholesale or large-scale couture. To be admitted into the group, each manufacturer underwent an annual evaluation. They had to produce at least 2000 garments per year, um, which I think is probably very ambitious. I don't know if that was adhered to. Um, and they had to quote, swear on its honor that no garments were copies uh, according to uh, the trade press. In addition to brands in this group, magazines also presented uh, garments by uh, department stores and the rare independent label like the Maison Vey or Chloe, uh, which are basically the only two labels that still exist today, making it making the industry hard to study. One of the best um, means of, of accessing information is through the trade press. Um, notably, the journal of the ready to wear trade uh, syndicate, the Fédération Française des Industries du Vêtement Féminin, 
So you're looking at some issues of its, uh, of its cahier, its publication, uh, which resumed publication in 1947 after uh, seven years of inactivity during the war. In the 40s and 50s, issues express the industry's goals to industrialize, to increase exports abroad, to improve the organization of the entire textiles network, as well as fears of technological shortcoming exacerbated in view of France's wartime losses and the new competition from the United States ready to wear or sportswear industry, which had grown dangerously successful during the war period. Whereas in France, production was largely based around home workers and contractors. In one 1948 article on the state of the industry, the author Jacques Roux stressed change, speedy and mechanized movement and rationalization. Quote, the wind has blown in and swept away old fashioned methods in all the branches of the French clothing industry. People everywhere are studying the breakdown of work or the synchro system. Everyone is ruthlessly chasing away dead time unnecessary and costly workers' gestures. These comments drew on early 20th century um, uh, theories of scientific management, American largely, um, borrowing from Taylorism and Fordism in terms of reducing process times, motions involved, and assembly line production. After World War II, France's backwardness was defined or redefined as insufficient productivity. These earlier methods of rationalization informed the post-war concept of productivity. It was really a buzzword at the time, believed to be key to France's modernization. These ideas were also enforced from 1948 into the 1950s through the European Recovery Program uh, and specifically the Marshall Plan's uh, productivity missions where teams of about 20 people from the same field of industry would travel to, the, to study uh, American um, production and commercialization techniques. In addition, many ideas about branding and publicity were gleaned through uh, two voyages, uh, which pertain to the women's wear industry, taken in 1952 and 55, um, and members of the press attended the latter. After the mission, there's even an article in Elle written by two um, of its journalists, um, Annie Rivemal and uh, Alice Chavan recounting their trip. Um, they're very impressed by the organization of the American industry um, and they illustrate it uh, in the center there by a grid connecting textiles, manufacturers, retailers, and the press to the clients, discussing perfectly timed coordination. At the time, the Fourth Republic was notoriously unorganized and fragmented. So this also had um, political significance. Um, their most important discovery, however, was the American notion of commercialization, which started with creating a renewable demand for a product. They write, in America, they know it isn't enough to have invented a style to sell. It is just as essential to create the desire or need for it. And so at this time, we see, um, a clear connection between the trade and the fashion press, notably about educating the consumer um, through propaganda. They use that word a lot, whether in didactic articles that listed the benefits of ready to wear or in ads and editorials that listed makers and where to buy the clothing. So you're looking at an ad by the Maison Veil I mentioned earlier, um, who's still around, anyone is in Paris and wants to shop. Um, they were, they attended some of the early missions and um, took a lot of the publicity directives very seriously. And then to the right, an ad that appeared in Vogue um, that uh, shows the, the, the group label, Les Trois Hirondelles, that grouped individual brands uh, who were also Maison de Couture en gros. Um, uh, so, and as I noted, we see more editorial um, imagery of prêt à porter which attempted at this time to reconceptualize fashion within the framework of industrial modernity or fashionability to allow ready to wear to enter into its, the symbolic product, uh, construction of fashion. So this means, for instance, articles that portrayed models next to heavy machinery national construction projects like this one in Elle, 
uh, which reported on the completion of a hydroelectric dam on the Rhone. It discussed the quote, fashion concrete marriage uh, seen in these images of models posed next to turbines and factory walls. Um, both were cast as new and monumental national creations uh, and women as explorers and stakeholders in this new industrialized France. The, this connection could be made because ready-made dress was also produced through mechanized fa factory production, supposedly. The values of speed and productivity underpinned the magazine's new construction of the feminine ideal. A 1953 editorial that you see here called Dress Yourself for Current Times set the tone for subsequent articles that discuss the success of French prêt-à-porter and its relevance for modern practical lifestyles and budgets of women who, quote, have neither the time nor the money to get dressed to measure. That's a quote from this article. And indeed, the accompanying photograph of a triangle of mo models perched alertly illustrated the communal worries of women apropos the fast paced rhythm of modernity. This was also communicated in image um, production, whereby in this image, Reader's eyes worked to touch the fuzz of the tweed. Its stiffness echoed in the angularity of the model's poses, garment lines, and graphic details. They, in turn, worked to uphold their stances, reliant on each other's bodies to stay upright, their exaggerated expressions amplifying the drama. The colors were equally coordinated down to the red accents of hair, fabric edging, and lipstick. As such, the heavily constructed image carried strong, strong implications um, uh, concerning the intricate manufacture of female appearance and identity. The appropriate clothing was crucial to the success of this picture. The author also employed terminology that evoked readiness in describing the dresses as tout fait, all done, or tout prêt, all ready, which were used prevalently, prevalently throughout the decade. Um, remember that Vogue section. And it implied though that the reader herself ought to be ready for whatever the modern world had in store. Likewise, a fabric, uh, the fabric from this 1953 dress, which was sold at the department store, Printemps, could also be, be viewed as another tool of speed. It was made from fibrane, which was a silk-like viscose um, rayon that was both washable and wrinkle-free. Um, both of, of, of these pieces of information were printed here, as you see on the self edge. Armed with this um, textual reassurance of quality that masked industrial reality, the wearer um, embodied a blend of decoration and, and, industry, and technology. The article that I was just speaking about also visually asserted its focus on time in other photographs of models who were looking at their wristwatches, uh, standing atop oversized clocks. They were acting out busy scenarios and seemed very unprepared and, and uh, behind in a race against time. Much like the position of the post-war clothing industry, which sought to catch up to other in more industrialized um, uh, markets. And we start to see a narrative whereby ready to wear times the day perfectly. So for instance, in this 1956 editorial, um, we see a discussion about three real women, a housewife, a shopkeeper, and a secretary. Quote, here are three young women with very different lifestyles. Like you, perhaps they live outside the city and must in the morning equip themselves for comfortable travel, their activities, and for dress your evenings out. So this is Marie-José, the mother, who, um, who is shown here um, doing all of her different activities, taking her child, gardening, shopping the city, etc. Um, all of them are visualized in a grid-like pattern. Reflecting on the post-war period, Jean Baudrillard wrote that the measuring of time produces anxiety when it serves to assign us to social tasks, but makes us feel safe when it substantializes time and cuts it into slices like an object of consumption. And this imagery, which separated and organized women's commodities, activities, and spaces in compartments and rows, evoked structuralism's conception of the world as a system of 
related things. This philosophical movement that swept through post-war France or French intellectual life was also visible in the magazine down to the different meanings that could be made by mixing and matching clothing pieces. Um, as you see in the case here of Annette, the secretary in the article, whose quote, transformative two-piece outfits allowed her to renew her wardrobe whilst easily moving um, in between activities. So the outfit could adapt to different situations by pairing a smock or a poplin blouse or a low cut sweater and crinoline petticoat for the evening. And we also see Elle's language of, Elle in particular, uh, it's language of problem solving in relation to its many articles on architecture and home decorations, home decoration. In fact, Conversations around women's professionalization within the home often surface in um, this magazine, and that included the 1955 um, government stipend, uh, Allocation de la Mère au Foyer for at home mothers, which, while it um, professionalized their place within the home, it also served to, to keep them there and outside of public um, workspaces. And so, all of the problems of space within the domestic realm can really be seen to signify existential issues. These are ideas that are coming straight out of Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. Um, magazines easily inferred the, the symbolism and importance of interiors as the home um, became really central during the post-war urbanization and housing crisis. Elle even um, started a section devoted to these issues where we see the presentation of new modernist, often low cost housing um, estates, uh, the Grand Ensemble, and how to solve the problems that, that they presented, like small spaces, standardized rooms, like this one um, built in the newly built town outside of Paris. Re uh, oops, this one. Um, Saint-Dizier-le-Neuf. And of course, prefabs were presented as a big solution to the housing problem. According to this article, quote, tout près, already, is the magic slogan of 1954. It's the gaining of time, fatigue, and money. Fashion has its prêt à porter, urbanism its prêt à monter. That is, the prefabricated house, which you can order by telephone and have delivered and installed within days. New method for the bold and rushed, end quote. Um, and in all of these examples, uh, fashion or uh, um, architecture, women were positioned as the main builders, um, as this article on the Minute House, um, the prefabricated mini, Minute House in 1957 also asserted um, through such professionalization of the domestic, Elle was um, uh, communicating that women's creativity and productivity and efficiency allowed them to function in the modern world. However, this agency and modernity was fraught with contradiction in post-war France, which was marked like in other um, places during this time by the revalorization of female domesticity. And in France, this, there was a real disconnect. Women won the right to vote uh, in 1944, but it took about 20 years until the marriage law was amended for any, other, any further legislation actually um, uh, manifesting change. Um, so the marriage law in 1965 gave them control of their own assets within marriage, but they were still legally subservient technically to their husbands, according to the Napoleonic Code Civil. And similarly contradictory, Elle stressed speed and readiness in women's lifestyles and purchases, yet imagery of stylized, immobilized women resorted in a really distorted sense of time for the reader. Um, but the press started to display a heightened interest in movement uh, as, a, as a measure of realism in parallel to growing expressions of discontent in feminist literature, the, um, the Mouvement Démocratique Féminin group, as well as the, um, the family planning movement, uh, which was um, really a, 
an important feminist um, movement in France, as well as efforts to amend the marriage law. Agency implied by freedom of movement was echoed in articles that positioned the fashionable woman as architect of her self-presentation. Um, so for instance, this 1960L editorial, Rushed Yet Organized, um, presented hurried women walking purposefully. In other photographs, clothing was laid out over maps of central and outer Paris, the tools of women's movement across the growing city. One model was caught mid-step against the blurred visualization of an automobile, both expressions of urban modernity that in turn accentuated the speed of her movement and her suit, described in the text as tailleur va partout, suit that goes everywhere, would soon take her out of the picture frame. So as a whole, the images fashioned a resourceful and productive woman who efficiently moved between professional and um, domestic spheres, and as such, they attached to modernism in shaping a unified fashion narrative, a complete picture. Increasingly into the decade, filmic images fragmented reality ever so slightly, hinting at a postmodern shift. Uh, and this 1963 photograph by Fouli Elia um, depicted a cross-legged model engulfed by a nondescript modernist building staring at something located off the page. The photograph's skewed sense of space and time evoked invisible technologies that cut through large distances, cybernetics or other electronic networks behind TV, for instance, which caused for Jean Baudrillard, quote, the micro procession of time. The press continued to mythologize industrial production in its construction of fashion in the 1960s, however, Unlike 1950s editorials set against heavy machinery, invisible technologies were evoked. Um, and around this time, Elia, the photographer, along with other, others like William Klein, were experimenting with the moving image. Um, for one, Peter Knapp, who was Elle's artistic director, and Elia filmed a variety show episode on three designers, including Manuel Kahn and Michel Rosier. Uh, and at certain points, the camera panned in and out, in this case, making the graphics of Khan's geometric designs um, change and, and move, testing the capabilities and boundaries of dress and image making. While Khan envisaged the, the garment on a moving body, as seen from her uh, uh, illustration uh, here to the right, um, so all the work done by the press in the 1950s of advertising, equating ready-made production with avant-garde design, progressive modernity and fast-paced budgeted lifestyles meant that a new group of designers uh, and designer-led brands were well poised for success and public recognition in the 1960s, including Khan and Rosier, uh, Christian Bailly, um, Sonia Riquel, Jean Cacharel, um, Karl Lagerfeld, uh, Daniel Hechter. Um, so I might actually end here. I'm, I went way over and I was hoping to um, kind of illustrate the, 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 the shift in, in uh, from productive bodies to fragmented um, postmodern bodies in the 1960s. Um, but in the, con in the context of uh, Paris's construction um, and, and uh, the growth of its suburbs. Um, but I think that that will be, we will not have enough time for that. So I might just end here uh, on this image uh, that shows two pages from 1963 L, one being the cover of uh, the, the book uh, under this landscape of, um, of, uh, um, of Paris, which has grown to be not just the central, uh, the center that we, we recognize in, in fashion magazines, but it is now, uh, vast and generic and is suburban. So yeah, I think I'll end, I'll end there. Okay, thank you so much. That was brilliant. And I think really gave such a 
a wonderful evocation of the book itself and how incredibly rich and textured it is in terms of these um, these contexts. It gives such a deep view of, of the development of Proto-Porte, but also these, these contexts of what's happening to French women over this period, to space, to um, the landscape, the urban landscape that they're inhabiting. So thank you so much, um, Alexis. And thank you um, for the questions. Do continue to drop in questions. Um, I'm going to start with um, a good question from John Michael O'Sullivan. Hello, John Michael. Um, he says, post-war couture was obviously hugely shaped by the appetites of the American market. And you've said about the influence of American ready-to-wear in industry on France. And he's just curious as to whether the whether um, the US had much of an influence on French ready-to-wear and its capacity as a consumer? Um, in its capacity... Uh... So I guess, you know, were, were two questions, I guess. Were, was, was America buying French ready-to-wear to sell in its department stores? And were American women individually buying? Oh, okay. Thank you. Well, uh, hi... JM, also thank you for. Uh, I'm happy to be to be able to thank you uh, out loud. the The model that I identified earlier was due to all of his uh, incredible research on um, on post war models. Uh, yeah, I think that well, that was the real um, that was a that was a struggle, um, and that was the work that was part of the work that the industry was was doing in the 1950s improving its its own production uh, to uh, close French the French market but also to export abroad um, and the US was um, you know an important an important market they were for instance also grooming the um, the Italian industry after the war uh, which um, be, ended up having a very important ready to wear high end ready to wear um, industry and so they were kind of competing with with them as well to to enter the American market. Um, there is an amazing uh, article in Vogue actually that shows American uh, women uh, American models um, wearing French ready to wear uh, next to all of these uh, ex architectural expressions of modernism, the Lever House. Um, the UN, um, and we know from reading in the trade press that they also, um, the whole a, a group of, from the industry went over there during this trip to, um, to um, show to buyers, um, to American buyers. So, so yes, that was definitely part of the, the work that was, what, that was being done. And the American press was taking note. I'm not sure how, how successful they, they were at, at exporting but yeah that was it, it was also happening at this time too oh Rebecca you might still be muted thank you um no I was just saying it's so interesting to think about these connections and how they shift over time and over the period that you're um that you cover in the book as well now let me see who else um Lilia Ziamu, thank you, Lilia. Um, she says, thank you, Alexis. How did you decide what sources to use? Did you start with some of them and then decide to add or eliminate sources during the process? Oh, huh. it's a big question. It is a big question. <laughs> I have to remember, how did I do it? Um, e well, on the one hand, I was, it was a struggle to find um, first-hand resources, ob object um, resources, surviving garments, because as I said, there is not very much in the way of brands that still exist from the earlier period studied, and museums tend not to collect ready-to-wear, uh, at least this, the, these, these garments, uh, the, the, the ready-to-wear that I was studying. So it was a real challenge. So whatever I could find was was great um but it's hard to as as the story as the narrative shifted and and became not only a story about the industry but about uh so many different cultural um uh attitudes and moments and 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 movements and and other kinds of objects 
yeah, I did have to uh, take away, edit down. And, um, and I'm sorry that I really thought I would cover more in this talk, um, <laughs> but there is a lot, uh, a lot uh, of, of various um, uh, pathways that this, that this book kind of goes down and relates clothing to. I don't know that that was a really good answer, Lilia, but you are my neighbor in Brooklyn, so I will <laughs> tell you, <laughs> hopefully in person, to discuss it a little bit more. No, I mean, I, I think you covered so much in your talk. I don't think you realize how rich it was. Um, but no, it, it's, I think it's amazing that I think, and you do it very beautifully because you, you manage to encompass all of those things without feeling like you're squishing anything in. It's all very natural and, and beautifully done. So Ira asks, she, uh, Ira says, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. And it truly was. And says, what was your favorite discovery as a researcher during this process? Oh, um, well, that too is, is very hard to, to answer. And I probably should have been prepared for that question. Um, <laughs> So Ira, also I would have to be happy to stay in touch and talk more about that. But um, I think that the conversations I had with, with people who lived through the period, especially the women who so generously shared their memories with me. And I was, I was going to read some, some of their, uh, um, some of their uh, extracts from their testimonies, um, but that was, yeah, discovering, you know, kind of their interpretation of things uh, that just, and making connections to, to um, the, the, my history studies. Um, those were always wonderful moments. Um, meeting with uh, the, the journalist Claude Brouet, who I quoted, the designer Emmanuel Kahn, uh, who opened up her, her home to me and, 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 uh, yeah, those were those were wonderful moments, and 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 I and I made discoveries because those objects would not have been um, conserved anywhere else. Wonderful, thank you, um, Colleen Hill. Hello, Colleen. She says, "Thank you, Alexis. Wonderful presentation and book." She says, "I wonder if you could tell us what the holdings of Presa Porte are like within major French museum collections." Well. Um, so actually, Colleen's museum has maybe a better <laughs> holding the museum at FIT, where I did a lot of great uh, research. I showed the um, Emmanuel Kahn uh, op art mini dress, as well as a suede jacket and mini skirt ensemble by Dorothy Beast very early on in the presentation. Those both come from the museum at FIT. Uh, yeah, there's um there the the palais galliera has um has I, i'd say a nice um uh, assortment of garments coming from that earlier period and in fact um they produced a, a great book on the 1950s um a, an exhibition catalog a few years ago that um is it does stand stand apart in that it it offers um, context around some of those ready-to-wear garments. Um, and the, then there's the Musée des, des Arts Décoratifs uh, that has, that has a, 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 a richer assortment of, of pieces from the, from the 1960s. Um, and yeah, there's, other than that, the, you know, the, the, um, um, the, the YSL Museum, which, and I didn't talk about couture ready to wear, uh, but uh, in this talk, but they would of course have, have Reeve Gauche examples. Um, yeah, there's not too much. We, we need everyone to donate their, yes. their ready to wear to museums. I don't know if I'll upset curators saying that, but. But please do it anyway, and, and we'll try and be kind to the creators and make them happy about it. Um, Waverly Muse says, when did the American idea of sportswear become influential? 
<laughs> I guess in relation I think to they're, France. They're asking the wrong person <laughs> in this in this um, panel. Um, well, I think that it was remarked in the industry. Uh, I don't know that the sports, the American sportswear industry was uh, whether that they were selling to French consumers, but the idea, the images and the, 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 the identity of that industry um, constructed by image makers and the industry was certainly, um, and I tried to, to, to explain how that was transported to mm -hmm. France. And so it would have been influential even if uh, consumers weren't really aware of where it was coming from. Yeah, it was it, prêt à porter is a literal translation of ready to wear. It is, it, it illustrates that this is an Anglo-Saxon American uh, kind of construction. Mm, that's really interesting. That's so interesting. Um, Russ Ananich says, "Did you manage to locate Joe Frankie in the end?" <laughs> no. Okay. That's very cryptic. But we'll, we'll, we'll keep moving because there's lots of questions. <laughs> okay, Olivia smells. Hello, Olivia. Says, thank you, Alexis. This was wonderful. She says, you touched on the association between ready-to-wear suit and images of transport, modernist buildings, etc. Were there any other recurring associations made between specific items of clothing and other symbols of modernity? Um, yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, there were, well, so there were, um, in the press, um, uh, articles that interspersed, right, these ready to wear clad models with industry projects, um, and, and high, high modernist, uh, architectural, um, examples, but also industrial design and furniture. Um, and, uh, and, and, and appliances, um, domestic appliances that were, um, also conceived to be these beautiful technological modern things. Um, so that for sure in the, in the fifties, mm -hmm. especially. Yes, I remember um, you had a, a great photo spread that had a, the model in her lovely ready to wear and then all her amazing kitchen gadgets. Yes, yes. Well. That, that was <laughs> by Lionel Kazan. Ah, oh, um, yes. Which is an, another wonderful photographer. Such a um, great photographer. And yeah, one of the, you know, I tried to also in this work highlight the work of photographers who aren't necessarily. Um, as well known as as as, as others. Mm. Um, no, I think you really highlight some some fantastic photographers in the book. It's it's great. Um, this this might be the last one. We've only got a couple of minutes left, and that you've had so many messages and so many lovely lovely messages and brilliant questions. So we'll we'll make sure that Alexis gets all of this, all of your comments, all of your questions, so that she can she can read through them and follow up with you. Um, if she if she has time because she she's promoting her book all right sally handler hello sally she says can you elaborate on the relationship between um parisian architecture as a visual signifier of modernity and nationalism in french post post-war pret-a-porter imagery and if this was meant to intentionally parallel the american industry's use of of new york city as contextualization of sportswear previous to this mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I think that image makers were very purposeful in um, in choosing these uh, spaces, and we start to see, you know, the very uh, the classic Paris and those spaces, but then also um, kind of very nondescript parts of the city. Um, sidewalks, um, uh, you know, saying that fashion is sort of every day and not, and not this um, uh, historic um, 
uh, erratic, uh, elitist um, thing, um, as well as, uh, um, and I, don't, I didn't show any of these images, but the, the suburban spaces, the, the, um, the uh, examples of, of um, international modernism, I guess, but in, uh, in low cost housing estates. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a little bit all over the place because it's, it is actually an important part of the book, um, but there is also uh, um, conversations about within um, architectural circles about using about using international modernism for cultural diplomacy and showcasing all of these um, the, the talents of architects to the world. Um, and I think that to to put out a certain image of of um, the of of the health of of politics, but also art making, and and yeah, fashion is sort of interwoven into that into that dialogue as well. Um, that was a really good question that I, I I'd like to. <laughs> it's fun to think about better. more. No, I, I yeah. mean, as I say, you've got so many lovely, lovely questions. I just want to um, ask this one, Teresa Romana, who I suspect is related to you. Hello, Teresa. Um, just because this is a good question in relation to the book itself, who asks if the book will be translated into French and published in French. Um, hi, Mom. <laughs> oh, is uh, your mom? Hello, <laughs> Alexis is gone. <laughs> uh, that, would, that would be a good, a good next step, but so far there are no, yeah, there are no, um, there are no plans for that, but hopefully there are no it. plans, but we would love it to happen. Yeah. Um, so let's draw a close. Thank you so much to everyone for attending. Thank you for all your wonderful questions and comments. Biggest thank you to Alexis. So many congratulations to you. I'm thrilled beyond words. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. Everybody buy the book. It's brilliant. So thank you so much. Um, Alexis for a wonderful talk and for introducing us to, to your book. Um, I want to give a big, big thank you to everyone at the Research Forum, Grace, Leila and Acacia, who are incredible and, you know, produce everything so beautifully and calmly and seamlessly. So thank you to, to them. Thank you to the Documenting Fashion Research Group um, for everything they've done, including Alexis. So thank you to them. Thank you to Bloomsbury for everything they've done um, helping promote the book. And yes, thank you to everyone. Have a beautiful summer, everybody. And we will be back in the autumn with more events for you. So enjoy your evening or your morning or your afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you, Alexis. And bye bye to everyone. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. <laughs>